The uh, the first thing that I like to do is if I could just have your name to say your name and spell it for me, so I have okay. it on tape. All right. Now, mm -hmm. my name is Marie Parker. M A R I E P A R K E R. You you were a nurse within which branch of the of the service? I was an army nurse. When I first went in, I went to uh, the Pocatello Army Air Base. And then from Pocatello Army Air Base, after we were there for a certain length of time, we were transferred to uh, Fort Swift, to Texas. And from there, uh, we went to Newport News, Virginia. And that's where we left overseas on a ship. Uh, I have a big uh, certificate in one of my rooms of uh, going overseas on that ship because we had a big celebration, you know, when you have to join the, become a, uh, one of Neptune's. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. You have to, you have to uh, go through the initiation process and all that. You know? <laughs> but anyway, I enlisted. Well, it's a long story. You know, I graduated from nurses training in, in, uh, 41. Um, in those days, there were two uh, careers open for girls, mostly teaching and nursing. And so I chose nursing. And I went to this little school in South Dakota for three years for $60. That's, and that was quite a bit at that time. <laughs> but anyhow, because my father had died when he was 40 years old, and mother was left with five of us in 1930. And so she had a, we had a struggle for quite a while. But once we got into high school and got out, we all started, uh, you know, doing something worthwhile, at least, uh, we thought it was. And eventually, you know, how you get around, you got graduate from training and you, you get a job and you go here and you go there and you work. And my brother and I both came to Seattle. We were both in Seattle, my uh, second to the youngest brother. and. Um, he joined the Marines from Seattle. And then after he joined, I thought, well, it'd be nice. I saw the, um, uh, I, we were watching a program put on by the Navy in downtown Fifth Avenue in Seattle. And I saw all those beautiful Navy nurses. <laughs> they looked so nice in their uniform and everything. So I thought, well, um, that might be a career, you know, to go in. So I, on May 29th, 1943, I signed up with, went down to the, I suppose, the public uh, city building or whatever it was, raised my right hand, and so help me God, I was, was uh, enrolled in the Army Nurse Corps. And like I say, from there I went to, I was sent to Pocatello Air Base and was there for a few months made lots of friends, you know, and, but the friend and, uh, that I was closest to, there, we had boyfriends, you know, we had airmen we liked, and we were always together, the four of us. But then she went to the South Pacific, and I went down to uh, Texas, over to India, and the boys went, one went to uh, 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 the South Pacific as well, but not her friend, and one went to England. So there we were, uh, separated. Wow. But now, had uh, you had you done any nursing? I, I mean, you'd gone to school and already uh -huh. studied nursing. Were you a nurse before you? Oh yes, I okay, was working so in done... hospital. I was working in Seattle, at a hospital at the time that I enlisted. And of course, that was an honor then, you know, everyone was so enthused to think that uh, so many young people were going into service. There was no protesting and no, you know, running to Canada or anything like that at the time. And, and it, it really was a wonderful thing, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, well, it was security at that time because jobs were, you know, you didn't get much pay and, well, I don't know. It was just another adventure, I guess, for me. <laughs> so life. you got you got uh, stationed in India then. So then we went. We were thirty-two days on board this ship, 
we were surrounded by uh, submarines and, and little ships guarding us and everything. Well, there were 6,000 of us on the ship going over, not only nurses, but army and, and uh, chaplains and Red Cross and everything else, you know. But we did stop at Cape Town for a couple of days, so we were allowed to get off there for a couple of days and walk around. Then we landed in Bombay uh, after 32 days, and, and they allowed us to go up after a certain length of time up on board uh, uh, topside. And it was like going into another world, another culture. There were all these little men with these just little things around their waists, you know, and, and something on their heads. And so, and from Bombay, we got on board a train and we went to uh, three weeks on this Indian train up to where our hospital was to be at Lido, Assam, India. That was what the destination was at that time. Wow. So that's uh, kind of by the Himalayas. Is that where you are at the foot of the Himalayas? At the or? foot of the Himalayan mountains. Now, had you ever been out of the country prior to? No, uh, no. So here you are, a young 20-some-year-old. Yeah, yeah, I was, I think, how old was I? In 43. I was born in 20, so I must have been about 23 years old, something like that. Huh. Yeah, I was quite young. We celebrated our May birthdays on board ship, you know, it was when we left. And so uh, it must have been in May that we were traveling along. And so we always, it was so nice. We had a big celebration, you know. They did everything on board ship to try to make our lives pretty much worthwhile. The nice thing about it was that we were free to go to, to mass or to church services or whenever up on deck, you know, they would have things like that for us. But the trip to, um, on the Indian train, you know, is an, a new experience in itself as well. I don't know if this is what... Yeah, no, this is exactly. Yeah. It is? Yeah. Because there were about four or six of us to a compartment, and the beds were just uh, like a platform coming out from the wall of each side, and uh, not much padding on it or anything hot, you know, it was really hot. A couple of the GIs found a, a big tub somewhere along the way with some big chunks of ice. I don't know where they got it, but then we'd try to fan it, fan it, the ice, you know, to make it cool. Take the cool air off of it. But at night, um, all the cockroaches and everything would come out, and so we'd kind of one of us would be on guard most, <laughs> take turns, to keep the cockroaches away from us and everything. And every time the train would stop uh, and we'd open the doors and we could look out and everything, there would be all these little Indian children and everything. Bakshis, Mimsa, Bakshis. They were begging for money, you know, and things. And so that was kind of sad, you know, we didn't like that. But it took us three weeks to get up to our destination. Do, do you remember what you were, th was it? Exciting or was it scary? Or because I mean now you're, I mean you got a couple things going on. You 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 left the U.S. You're in a new country. You're going to war. You've got all these different things. Do you remember what you thought? Well, you know, there's so many of us in the same situation, and I, I don't know. I never did ever. I was never afraid of anything. I never was sick one day when I was in India. I never was sick. I, I don't even think I had a headache. But we had to take Adabrin and all that, you know, to keep us from getting malaria. We turned yellow, I think, after a while. But, um, you know, uh, I've never been afraid. I always think what's to be will be. You have to accept things like this. And this is the Army. So, And we were nurses, and we had a lot of respect. You know, they were the GIs on board... Uh, the train would would cook, uh, would try to help us out. You know, we had sea rations or whatever they were then. Um, we said he used it. Sometimes when they'd start, like they'd make cream of wheat, they said it was cream of wheat and everything, and these big garbage cans, they'd have it outside the train. And if we'd stop, after a while we got so we thought, it looks just like worms, you know, from India. So we wouldn't eat it. So we'd just turn to our sea rations and keep them. 
Well, that's a long adventure. I mean, <coughs> that long on a train. And to spend all that time on the train. But anyway, once we got there, <coughs> the the hospital was arranged, I guess, before we got there. It must have been, as I remember correctly. But each uh, bash, we called them bashes, each set of where people were going to live was just a cement slab on the floor. And then they'd have uh, maybe two, two to a room, you know, what we called a room. And we'd have mosquito nettings over our beds and things like that because of malaria, the mosquitoes and things. And uh, so uh, we had uh, uh, lister bags hanging up. We called them Mr. Canvas bags that were uh, purified, you know, with uh, what do they do? To pur what do they do to purify the water? Because everything in India was contaminated at that. We couldn't eat anything from the ground or drink the water or anything like that. So if we wanted uh, water, we'd have to go out to the lister bag and get some <laughs> some water from there. And uh, most of most of I think the food that we had at the mess hall was uh, uh, dehydrated <laughs> stuff. It was such a treat at Thanksgiving or Christmas or sometime if someone would fly in a nice turkey or <laughs> roast or something, and the fellows tried their best to make the food good, you know. But how it is? Of course, everybody griped, you know. <laughs> that was par for the course. <laughs> Some some common enemy was food. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> right. But we had a wonderful group of people working with us. We had wonderful doctors. The nurses were, well, my roommate. There couldn't have been anyone better than her for me to live with. And, uh, and we were all just friends, you know. It was just we were all there together, and we were going to do what we could and come home. And this little place I told you, Dibrigar, where we visited, you know, once in a while to go to the bazaar and all. And there was another place called Chabwa. And every once in a while, the fellows from Chabwa would call and say, or send a message or something, that they were having a dance on Saturday night. Could you come up? <laughs> Could you send, some, send us some gals, I suppose they'd say. So... Uh, People would go if you wanted to, if you weren't on duty or something for the night, you know, you could go up there and they'd fly down and get to take us home, you know. Well, this one night, uh, this happened and, and uh, some of the girls went and on the way home, the uh, plane crashed. I don't know what it was, it was kind of foggy and dark and the jungle and everything. And several of the nurses, all those that went on that trip that night, were killed. But do you know, I think, if I recall, one of the letters I got from the girls that I was telling you about when I answered my ad in the CBI roundup, she said she had gone up there that night with one of her friends flown up, but they decided that they would ride home with a couple of the uh, officers that night. You know, instead of taking the plane, they'd ride home in the car. And she said that's what happened. They were just saved. They just were not supposed to be on that plane that night. Wow. Isn't that something? That's a, a lot of the veterans we've talked to. It's real interesting because their kind of life um, perspective really changed, and they realized that that when it was going to be their time, it was going to yeah. be their time, yeah. and they had no, no control, but they also had no fear of it. No. See, that's it. We just, well, you tried to make the most of everything. But when you're all together like that, you know, it's not, you know, you don't feel sorry for yourself or why am I here? I'm the only one. But uh, it was, uh, we had such good times. We had a little, uh, oh, what they call a clubhouse somewhere. And every Saturday night, the GI band would come to the clubhouse and uh, we would dance, you know, and socialize. And we did get, um, some uh, liquor supplies, you know, about once a month, I think they'd give us a quart of whiskey or something like that. And so we would just share it, you know, we'd just take it to the clubhouse. And Well, naturally, you know, you did. And that was fun, you know, we did have some fun. 
Occasionally, we would uh, hardly ever did we get off the base to go traveling to, up to Kashmir, probably maybe or to Calcutta. If you, if you could get a ride, you know, if you could go and you had time, a little time off. But other than that, so. Because you were pretty, I assume, pretty busy. Well, we were busy. Where you were there. at. Yes. Yeah. We were pretty busy. And, uh, you know, like I said, when we were there, penicillin was uh, discovered. And so when that came by, everybody came over, everybody got a shot of penicillin right off the bat. And <laughs> so that was helpful, you do, know. Do you remember, because here you were, you'd been a, a, a nurse over here taking care of whatever, you know, little scrapes and bumps and surgical and all that. And now all of a sudden you're moved over into the war environment. Do you remember when you saw your, when you knew that you were a war nurse? Well, the thing is, we probably, we knew that we were war nurses, but there wasn't any active, well, there was a place called Mission Awe, and that's where Merrill's Marauders were. And and the Japanese were coming up into that area from Burma up through Rangoon and into that area. And that was a pretty uh, dangerous situation. But right around our hospital, it wasn't too bad. There wasn't any shelling and bombing and things like that. So maybe if there had been, we would have been more frightened. But we used to get the uh, the Chinese troops that were injured from General Stilwell's troops up in Burma, and they would come down. But with those people, they were so unaccustomed to sanitary anything. We had to, they even laughed when we showed them a toothbrush, you know, to brush their teeth and things. And if some of them had a broken leg and they were up in traction or something, anybody's in the ward of theirs, they would stand around and laugh and poke fun. <laughs> you know, things they'd never seen anything like that before, and sometimes if they could walk, we had a certain section for that group of uh, soldiers, and they had dirt floors and stuff, you know, and and then their their little beds were just crisscross ropes, you know, with sheets over them. But even that, they were so surprised at what they had. Wow. And then uh, it wasn't unusual sometimes for one or two of them or whatever, to get up and just walk out of the ward and go down to the bazaar and get a lot of rice and spices and stuff, come back, start a fire in the middle of the ward and cook their dinner, because they didn't care too much, I don't think, about our American food. It was foreign to them, naturally. So anyhow, we learned a lot of things about different cultures, you know, there. Did you have, so you also had a lot of uh, American soldiers that were wounded? That oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of the boys. Mostly, I think most of them was like with broken bones and and jungle rot and, um, oh, what, dysentery and malaria and things like that, you know. And, of course, some of the boys, you know, if they would fly the hump and if their planes were shot down, that was pretty disastrous, you know, because, I don't know, someone said that sometimes if the Japanese caught them, they would, uh, I shouldn't say that maybe, but if they did, they would chop off their hands, and, and that would be it, you know. But anyhow, I never saw evidence of that myself, but, or I don't know if anyone else did, but when the boys did come home, if they were rescued, if the plane went down, it was pretty bad. They were all so good, you know, those kids that would take, and they had a lot of convoys, you know, trucks and everything, that they would carry supplies across the mountains to Stillwell and Schnault. Actually, that area of the war was so uh, nondescript to most people, they hardly knew there was a war going on there. And poor General Stillwell and Schnault really had to suffer for supplies because most of the supplies were going to Europe or to the South Pacific, you know. I think even today, uh, people that know just general history uh -huh. don't even really realize. I mean, you think of you think of you know Iwo and places like that, 
Pearl Harbor, you think of the Battle of the Bulge, and That's then you right. forget about places like India, Africa. That's right, because there was there was trouble going on in all those places, you know, and uh, so we, and General Stilwell was so highly honored, so highly respected, you know. Of course, he expected the best from his people, from his troops, and everything. From the Chi he was a very good friend of the Chinese. He was very good to them. And uh, they called him Vinegar Joe, you know, because he was really, <laughs> you'd think he was very severe, but he just, he loved those people. He was a Burma surgeon, you know, he did a lot to save people's lives there. Were they, were they pretty, um, your, what you had for facilities, could you provide real good care? Was it real primitive? I mean, did, could you just do basic? Uh... Well, in those days, the main thing that we did, probably in our hospital, was uh, provide IVs. Uh, we had quite a, like, a, I suppose people have broken bones. We had surgical equipment. They kept us pretty well supplied with that, you know, with things like that, that they could uh, uh, set bones and things, you know, and then treat, treat the medical part of them, you know. That was keeping people healthy, you know. So they could uh, fight. Yeah, we had, we had. Uh, I must say, we were we were pretty lucky that way to have pretty good uh, medical supplies. In the sense, you can hardly remember, but we had. You know, the Americans are so adept at uh, making things go and work. You know, with very little. So we had our laundry rooms, and we had our you know, makeshift this and that, the other, but it always worked, you know, like the boys did, all that. So anyhow, uh, we served our time there, and when the war in Europe ended, uh, they decided that our hospital was, we were, I suppose, as close to Japan as anybody, um, go uh, to uh, set up a hospital in Japan. And so, we uh, closed up our hospital, I think, in about a week <laughs> because we had to be on our way. And then we activated in Calcutta, all the nurses and everybody. We went to Calcutta for a week or two before we got a ship to take us <laughs> across the Pacific. <laughs> so we were 54 days on the ship going across the Pacific. But we did stop at Perth, Australia. You know, every once in a while those little stops were so important. <laughs> so we could get out and uh, walk around. And that was nice, being in Perth, Australia. But then we went on, went through a few typhoons, and, and uh, while we were on our way, they dropped the atom bomb on Japan. Well, that was a shocker, too, you know. And I think that made the typhoons worse. Some of the ships went down in that typhoon, but we were fortunate, and uh, we landed on Okinawa. Uh, I forget just what date it was. I guess I have a little autograph book somewhere. We landed on uh, Okinawa, and that's when I told you about climbing down over the uh, side of the ship, over the ropes, and and uh, this one nurse had a darting needle or something in her bag that got out. And when the GI was coming down over the ropes, you know, the crisscross rope, that thing jabbed him in the abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, he was so obsessed. Women coming to war, you know. <laughs> gotta buy, gotta buy friendly fire, I guess. <laughs> yeah, friendly fire. What anyway, was... every time I started out on a ship, I don't care when it was, how long it was, or what. Um, I was sick. The first few days out, I don't know why I was so oh, sick. Of the motion sickness. Yeah, that was just that was the only bad thing about all the. And then where we were about six deep in the hold, you know, I always tried to get a lower bunk so I would be close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Make the run. Yeah, make the run well, quickly. When, when you were in India, what, what were you a, 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 a um, uh, uh, what were your duties? Were you a, a ward nurse? Were you? Um, yes, I was a, a ward nurse. I was a medical ward nurse. Uh -huh. So you had a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with oh, these young boys. That oh, this was what was so nice. You know, this little girl Lillian, I have several pictures of her. She and I were on this one 
Ward M4 and like that Jimmy Shans and some of those nice Corman, Jack Bergen and oh so many that I remember that were so good you know and they of course nurses weren't supposed to at that time associate you know with uh, Corman I guess well I don't know it didn't bother us too much we never uh, shunned them or anything like that but you know you weren't supposed to go on dates I suppose with them and all that type of thing but you know but they were just wonderful yes uh, the wards were the beds were the wards were pretty narrow and the beds came out on both sides this way you know and and uh, we would we had a lot of camaraderie with the boys and the things and at that time uh, in our hospital the, the uh, African Americans were uh, segregated into their own wards you know that's the way it was then but we never we thought that was made it no difference to us we were nurses and we took care of them you know it was just like other patients too. so even if they were wounded they were segregated uh -huh, mm -hmm. that didn't wasn't an equalizer as far as I can remember wow. no. huh. but they had just the same amount of care and we took just as good care of them as we possibly could you know so Anyway, things have changed a lot since then. And when, yeah. when you think back, do you ever think of, of particular um, patients that you had, encounters with patients? And well, yes, there are some that I think of. I think especially of this one colored uh, black man. Um, I used to go in and talk with him, and he was so proud because I think one of his daughters or someone was getting married, and I think he felt good about being able to talk to somebody about it, you know. And so I used to go and have lots of conversations with him about what was going on at home and things like that, you know. Um, what it's so many, so many. Uh, so many things, you know, if you can see somebody that's so desperately ill and and they're recovering and getting better, you know, that's so important. <coughs> Sorry. Is, uh, is that what most of them, when you talk to them, because these are, again, young kids that, yeah. that are, are they just wanting to talk about home or do you remember what they talked about? Well, most of it was... Um, yeah, most of it was talking about home. I know that's how it was when we would meet at the clubhouse on Saturday nights, you know, and we'd talk. Because everybody was from a different part of the country, you know, and we'd say, what do you think about this? What would they do back home with this? And, you know, so everybody kind of shared their own little culture with everybody else. And that's what made it so kind of nice, too. You know, it's... When you talk to people, then one thing leads to another, you know, about where they were and where they're from and how they lived and, you know, their families. They like to talk about their families and stuff like that, you know. And we would uh, we would have a lot of fun talking with them. They were all so good. Were most of them from your facility? Do you patch them up and send, send them, back? them back? If we could. Yeah, like if they had dysentery or something and and uh, malaria, we'd try to help them get well and get over the worst part and then send them back. Yeah, they would. Were there kids that, that I mean, I imagine being out in the jungle and all that they're facing, besides the malaria and the jungle rod and everything like that, and then, and then to be fighting an enemy on top of that, were there <laughs> some that... That, uh, you mean kind of gave up or, or were, yeah, I had to go through depressed. that. Depressed. Depressed. Yeah. Is that? Did Did you face that? Well, some of them were. Some of them, you know, some of them were very young when they went there, and it's almost like they missed their mothers, you know, really. And you know, well, what am I doing this for? You know, it seems kind of hopeless sometimes. They would say, you know, what is this all about? Because, uh, well, in those days we had no television or anything, you know, we didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world unless we got it through newspaper or something, you know. But all in all, um, 
I can't remember of anybody going off the deep end or anything like that, but we did have psychiatric wards, of course, you know, to kind of help people talk. To, I think it helped them a lot if they could talk, talk things out, you know, talk about things, talk about what's bothering them. That type of thing is so important, I think. Well, it is with any kind of illness. You know, if somebody can talk about it and all that, you know. And, the, and, and so would they, would they often talk about what was happening in the jungle, or was it more they'd try to get their mind somewhere else? Or did you? Well, when they, ta they, they knew where they were, and they knew that, is she going now? I have to talk to her. I think some, she's just talking. I think her husband came for her. Oh, is that right? They were people, too. You know, Who, the, the corner? Corman. <laughs> <laughs> but he was from New York City. Well, I shouldn't say. I should wait and say. <laughs> what, so, so you had a, a specific uniform you had to wear? Oh, well, we had uh, our uniforms were very, very uh, simple, but very easy to care for. They were brown and white striped wraparound little dresses. And we had a little brown and white striped cap that we wore on our heads. And uh, like I said, we would go to the, we loved to wear those little Indian boots that those Indians made for us. We would go to the Indian Bazaar, put our foot down on a piece of white paper. <laughs> They'd trace around our footprint. And then uh, we'd come back in about a week and they would be finished. And they would fit perfectly. And they would go up about three quarters of the way up our legs. And they were just so comfortable and so wonderful, you know. So that was mainly. And then, of course, our we did wear slack suits, too. Where they were brown and white striped. Uh, Are you interviewing? So was that, a, was that a, 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 your dress suit then? Yeah, and then... I mean, is that one was kind of a civvy? Well, then, what, uh, then when we did have regular OD, uh, you know, uh, other than when we were traveling and so forth, where we were really, where it was uh, khaki, I guess, or something like that, but OD colored, you know, a shirt and, and jacket and slacks and things, but... When we were up there in the jungle, it was mainly seersucker stuff because it was hot. It was hot up there in India, you know. So <laughs> that's how it's like that. It was interesting because the picture you had on the ship, you you'd stopped at a beach somewhere and gotten off to go look at the beach, and it looked like you had a skirt on, and almost looked like maybe you had pumps on or something. Well, like. it, might, it might have been. Yeah, we had the, yeah we had skirts, and we had. Uh, I don't know if we had slacks to go with our jackets or not. We had, I don't have a picture of me. Well, it's just like that picture of me in the book with, uh, with the fellow at Pocatello. You know, that's kind of a uniform we would have, huh. you know. And some of them were blue and some were, uh, uh, there's a nice picture hanging on the wall in there, I think, of me in that uniform. But anyhow, uh, for dress dress up when we got back, like to the states or traveling somewhere where it was important, then we had something more uniform and regulatory huh. to wear. You know, like now, that. It, it sounds like you made lots of friends, and and mm -hmm. in some of those friends there were some young um, corpsmen once in a while. That oh, we could never have done it without the corpsmen. They were perfect. It just makes me cry to think of them. But they they were so good. They helped so much. They never hesitated, you know. Um, gosh, like, it was just, they were from all over, you know, the United States. They came from all over. That little Jack Bergen was from New York City, and he had that little New York accent, you know, and he was Irish and he was Catholic, and that was good for me. So, um, and and now he's the one that had a crush on you. Is that? Well, yeah, he. Well, I guess he did. <laughs> we used to uh, go for walks and things. You know, we could do that. I guess uh, apparently we did. It was on the picture. So, <laughs> anyhow, but you were not supposed to. Uh, uh, socialize with the like go to the uh, enlisted men's officers club enlisted men's club and things like that you know but 
to be friends with them, you know, and things like that. There was nothing wrong with that, I don't think. So you had that that everyday life. Yeah, I we mean, had that, that everyday that... life. Well, there were quite a few boys like that, like that little Jimmy Shands. It's so nice to think of them now. And you wonder what happened to them after all these years, you know. But anyhow... Um, uh, You'd go to dances and go movies? To, and... Yeah, but we never went with the enlisted men, you know. That was always with the officers when we were at uh, dances. And I suppose with that outdoor theater at Lido, uh, we probably went to some of the movies and they sat beside us or something, you know. Kind of like kind of like kids with parents where you had to s yeah. go separate and then yeah. sneak in and yeah. find each other in the right. dark or something. <laughs> right. Uh. Oh, dear. So uh, as much as I can remember, it was hot. And, and, uh, and you had rank, right? Yes, we were lieutenants. Uh, nurses were lieutenants, you know. So people referred to you as ma'am. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And salute, you know, salute us. Things like that. How did you like that? That must have been kind of a different experience. Well, it was. You know, it was, you had to get used to that. But you learned that, uh, you know, that that's the way it was. <laughs> that, the, the protocol. Well, yeah, the protocol. You had to do, you had to take care of that. And you learn to salute fairly well, you know, and and uh, when you had to, you know. And we had an awfully nice, uh, we had a nice, uh, you know, hospital staff that, that directed the hospital, you know, like the adjutant and all that, that really took good care of uh, all the personnel and saw to it that, you know, if anyone got too desperately ill or hurt or anything, they would be sent home, of course, you know, to the United States for better treatment or maybe back to England or Europe or someplace where the facilities were somewhat better. But other than that, I think we did pretty well at our little hospital we had. In those times, you know, when you're living through something like that, you don't realize how important it is. And you don't, you know, a person should have, kept notes on everything that went on and names of people. I had them somewhere once, I think, quite a few, but it's been, I've moved around quite a bit since I got home from service and everything. And it just seems like things kind of get lost in the shuffle. Somehow. Well, it seems, and I, and I think you, you started to touch on it, was that um, uh, when you're there and it's happening, it's just it, life ordinary. going on. Yeah, it's just ordinary, ordinary things going on in that situation. That's the way it was. Because you know? I'm guessing, and I don't know you can answer this, that, that I mean, did you realize you were a part of history at that time? Oh, heavens, no. No. We just knew that the war was on and that it had been going on for quite a while and that we were doing our best, you know. Well, we did our best at our job. And that's where most of the young people were in those days, was in service. And we never, we never had any trouble, as I can remember, at our hospital with drugs or alcoholism or anything like that. It just seemed like uh, people were uh, just, you know, you didn't want to cause trouble. You didn't want to... We never complained about our government. I can't remember of us ever griping about our president or anything like that. We just respected authority, I guess. That was what it was. Who did you, because, uh, so you were a, a lieutenant, who did you answer to then? Who, who? Our chief nurse. And what was she your? Was, her name was Louise Camden, as I remember. <laughs> she was our chief nurse. Yeah, she was. She was pretty strict, you know. She wanted us, when we were in uniform, to be in uniform, you know, and and that was it. And she never liked long, my hair was long and black at that time. <laughs> I had long black hair. But she never wanted long black hair hanging down over the uniform, <laughs> you know. And like Peg Leone said, when I get home, I'm gonna let my hair grow down to my feet. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she was our chief nurse, and so any problems that arose with the nurses, she would have to handle them and take care of them. But she was a very nice person, too. That was a lot of responsibility. 
Yeah, and on the base we had a we set up a nice little chaplain. I can't remember his name, but we had the nicest little priest there, who used to he threw up his hands many times at the way that you know how what the things were going on. You know, in the sense that uh, it was so different for him, but he was a wonderful person too. The chaplains were all very good, you know, and the, and people um, prayed a lot in those days. I think you weren't afraid to mention God and everything, you know. Did so, they have a, 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 a variety of chaplains, or did the chaplain have to do a... No, I think they had chaplains for, for uh, Catholics, Protestants, probably Jewish rabbis and things like that, as I remember. Of course, being Catholic, I would be more... Uh, in touch with the Catholic chaplain, but we go to mass every every Sunday and things like that, you know, and carry on and pray. And so that that we were never deprived of services. I know that, and they would come around, and they were just like one of the soldiers, you know. They really put their lives on the line too, you know. A lot of not only in, not so much maybe in India, but I'm sure in Europe and the South Pacific and everything. My brother was a Marine in the South Pacific for four years, and he went through all those horrible battles in the South Pacific. And then my youngest brother, Betty's husband, was a sailor. He was younger, but when he graduated from high school, he was in service, and he went to uh, the South Pacific to Japan after the war, you know, and everything. So we're a very patriotic family. We were. My oldest brother couldn't go because he had had uh, uh, trouble with his ears and he couldn't hear too well when he was younger. So he couldn't go. And my sister, of course, was married and had family. But anyhow, uh, we've always been a patriotic family. Could you, when you were in the service, did you have any idea? Did you have contact with your brother at all? Because you're in India and he's over fighting. Well, see, we did in those days, we had those little, uh, everything was censored. All the mail, everything we wrote or anything was censored. But I'd write home to mother, and things would be scratched out or everything, and he'd write home to mother, and so we would get news that way, then she'd write to each one of us. Ah, uh, so she was the way. clearinghouse kind so of. So she was kind of, yeah, so what she got, I guess, was <laughs> about half of what was going on in each way, but it was pretty scary. She was, a, my mother was a musician and a beautiful pianist, and so all the time that we were, we're Catholic, I don't know, you know, but if this makes any difference or not, but all the time that we were in service, my mother every morning played the organ in church and sang the high mass in Latin for us. So that was pretty nice. Wow. That had to be hard for your mom. Well, yeah, because she, you know, she uh, she struggled to raise us. Like she said, because your dad yeah. died when... Yeah, when she was 35 in 1930 at the beginning of the Depression, if you can imagine that. I was going to say, the Depression, and then you had, what, five? She had kids. five kids. And no money, nothing. Like I said, we always were like Topsy in Uncle Tom's cabin. We just growed, <laughs> you know, that's all. But we did a pretty good job of it, I think. And it's interesting because I, I don't know, you, you can give me your perspective on this. Uh, looking back, you understood that it was a depression, but did you realize it at the time? Everybody was kind of out of money at that time, everybody, you know. It was probably worse for a woman with five kids, but uh, but I think nobody had much money then. If anybody had any money, if they were considered, you know, well off. But uh, everybody at that time was pretty in the, much the same boat. There and mother finally got a job in WPA, uh, you know, and she was in charge of a sewing room for ladies or about forty ladies under her. And she would make little uh, overalls for the boys and little dresses for girls. And, and she did a lot for the Indians. We lived in South Dakota. That's where I grew up. And uh, down in the breaks and everything, the Indians, she'd take uh, 
flannel sheets and all that kind of blankets and stuff out to the Indians because huh. they were out there in the cold winters, you know. I don't know. There's so many things go on in a person's lifetime. You know, you don't really dwell on it till you start talking about it and thinking about it, you know. Because it's just like you being a nurse in the service. It was, there was a job and everybody was doing the same thing. And yeah. And you, you did what you were supposed to do, what you were sent there to do. And you tried to do your best. Now you had, you had a, 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 a one picture from uh, India that was of a, of a cemetery at the where where you were a nurse uh-huh. and you talked about the plane that had gone down uh-huh. was that was that for soldiers too was that what? oh yes uh-huh. uh-huh and i think uh i think some of the nurses that were killed in that plane uh, were buried there first and then they probably they could be sent home i guess afterward sometime it would be interesting to be able to go back to that area uh up to Lido and and see you know where all these Places are now. See how much it's changed. Uh, how much has just changed and everything. Yes, that was for. They had to have a cemetery there for, for boys, you know, and girls. I can't remember uh, of anybody from our medical hospital, other than the nurses that were killed in that plane crash, at Red Cross girls or whoever it was. Uh, being being buried and having big funerals and things like that, you know. But, you know, then on holidays, like I said, there was a picture there of the 4th of July and everybody would try to, try to pretend we were stateside, <laughs> you know, and get carry on. That must have been kind of, especially the 4th of July, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. American independence right. over in India. Yeah, right. You know. So anyhow, that's the way it was. What about like, could you, did, I assume you spent a Christmas there then? Yes, we were there at Christmas time. What? You know, what we used to do, we had uh, all that Adabrin tablets, you know. And uh, so we would uh, put a lot of those Adabrin tablets, tablets in a pan of water and we'd dye some of our mosquito netting and make little curtains out of it, you know for our bashes and stuff. It would dye kind of yellowish green and stuff. And we'd make little curtains for our for our bashes. But Christmas is, yeah, well, we tried to celebrate it just like we would if we were home, you know. I can't remember. We probably drew names or something and, and tried to, if we ever got somewhere out of camp, get... Uh, but they didn't have like PXs and things like that that I can remember, you know. But we were always supplied with uh, with uh, toothbrushes and toothpaste, you know, toiletries that we need. Cigarettes. But it was always nice to get a box from home oh, and yeah. find some things in it, you know, that uh, that we wanted. That's when uh, when nylon stockings were coming into vogue, you know. That's when they were coming. So it was always nice to get some new pair of nylon hose and and some nice shampoo or something. <laughs> so would your mom? Would I know the Red Cross is something, but would your mom? She'd send packages. They could huh. if they could get them. Take a while to get there, you know. But but we would. It was always nice to get a package. Christmas holidays, things like that. I imagine that that, that Christmas. Uh, became even more special uh. yeah you know every we held things more dear i guess then well we we never th- thought we would never get home that something would happen but you couldn't help but realize that you were on a mission that was dangerous you know i mean i don't know how to express it we never dwelt on it at all that but uh, there was always a possibility, you know, that something would happen. Just like there is now, if you fly in the sky, it's, you never know if you'll get to your destination or not. But you don't not fly because you're afraid to, <laughs> you know. So it was the same of being a nurse, uh, and yeah. you didn't, didn't, huh? you didn't yeah. So you yeah. don't remember, um, it, say, a, a, if a soldier passed away, came back from fighting and passed away, there, you don't remember a big funeral for him? Or? 
I can't remember that unless his squadron would do it, you know. Uh, I can't remember it, that we had any huge big funerals with a procession and everything, you know. I can't remember that we had any. Because I would imagine, and maybe I'm wrong, that that became, there was a certain aspect of it that became I every think day. wherever the military funeral was, that's where they would take the body, probably, if he died. And of course, they'd have to write home and, and you know, give all the information. But I think, um, I think that's where that would care, be taken on, like people go out to the Tahoma National Cemetery here. We have, we're so fortunate to have that here now. And uh, lots of, they have about 12 or 15 funerals a day out there sometime. But that's like it would be over there. They'd have a special place for them for this, and a special ceremony for the body and so forth. And I suppose like if he belonged to a, a group and everything like that. Yeah. Now you, you told me um, earlier you were describing the latrine. Tell me about that, uh, getting to the latrine from where you... Well, I guess give me kind of a picture of the... the, the vill, was it a village that you were in or a no, city? No, it, it was just our hospital. Just your hospital out in the middle of just, nowhere. Yeah, just our hospital out there at the foot of the hills. But then apart from our bashes, you know, the uh, GIs had built up this... Uh, a bamboo wall, you know, around this area, and somehow or other they had figured out how to get some water down there that would be enough for us to shower, you know. So we would, but it was tall grass that we had to run through on the way from the basha to the mich to the latrine, and those tall grasses were filled with leeches and everything, goodness knows what kind of bugs and snakes and everything else. So we would run down there and we'd try to get, if we had leeches on us, try to get them off by showering and soaping and everything like that. But then um, uh, on the way back, if, we, if the leeches got onto our legs or anything, then we'd have to try to burn them off with a cigarette or salt or something like that. If they get into your bloodstream, that was pretty bad, you know. It, 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 it sounds like you running the shower was almost pointless to a certain extent. I know. Cause you get cleaned up and then... Yeah, back. But anyhow, it was it was nice to have it, have the latrine there, you know. So you to had... To do that was mainly, yeah, well, it was a latrine and then a shower as well, you know. So anyhow. And you had a, you had a nice chapel. We had a lovely chapel on base. We had uh, oh, what? The wards were nice. They were clean. The, our medical wards were nice and clean. Uh, and we were always free to go and talk to anybody in the higher up that we wanted to. You know, anyone who was in charge of the hospital or anything. I never did, but I'm sure that some people did. You know, and and we always had male companionship if we wanted it, you know, like the officers and everything, you know, we could always go with them, and they were always good, and so forth, so, anyway. Oh. Betty has to leave. <laughs> Sounds like you've been extremely an, a an active person all your time, all your uh, life. All my life, I've just, yeah, I have, I don't know why, but I just, jump from one thing to another and you know I got my uh, when I came back from service I got a bachelor's degree in nursing from Seattle U and I, I worked at that taught at uh, Harborview for a while I went to the UW and got a master's degree and then uh, I had several teacher friends who were teaching school and uh, at that time nurses didn't have too much to go on as far as future uh, benefits and so forth were concerned. And I kept saying, Marie, why don't you change and become a teacher? Why don't you? And they used to tell me about how much fun it was <laughs> with the kids on the playground and everything, you know. So so um, I decided I went back to Seattle. You got a, I didn't have long to go to get my uh, credentials for teaching in public schools, so I did that. So then I went on and got my, uh, 
Well, I had my master's in nursing. And so after I taught school for, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, after I taught school for about four years, then I, I went to England and taught school in England. I was at the army base in England for a year. And it was close to Manchester, which was nice because that's where all the big uh, plays came first before they went to London. Wow. So Sound of Music and everything, we saw that on stage before it even got to to London. So uh, uh, came back and kept on teaching. I, I, I became so interested in library work, you know, it was interesting. The kids, that's when they were starting to do a lot of research and all. So, and I liked that. So, uh, and I got to know all the students in the school and all the teachers and everyone like that, which was really nice, you know. So, um, uh, then I got my degree, master's in librarianship. Wow. So I had to, and all the time that I was doing that, mother was here. Of course, she could take care of the house, and she did the cooking and things like that, which was a great help to me. And uh, I would do all, still all the yard work and everything, but you can. T so, um, anyhow, I've had kind of an active life. You know, and once I volunteer at the Puget Sound Blood Center. One of my clients. Really? Yeah, I did. In fact, did you go to their, not this year, but last year I did the video for the, they do a thank you uh, luncheon. In fact, they just had the one this year, but they do a thank you luncheon. Oh, yes. For all oh, the volunteers. We always have a wonderful luncheon. And I did the video for the one a year ago with oh. Officer Ron Tuggle and I can't think of the woman's name, but she was from the... Um, she had breast cancer, and she was from the uh, food bank in Seattle. The one was a state patrol trooper that had been in an accident and had blood donated to oh, her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Huh. Well, I work over at Tukwila at the Puget Sound Blood Center. Oh, yeah. I've been with them for a long, long time. Huh. And uh, just this is the first time I've kind of missed, you know, going. I had my turn. But uh, anyhow, so... Um, so I I was doing all that, and then with the Legion, you know, I've been commander of that post, I don't know, about three or four times. You know, I just, this is the first year. I was the commander the last two years until this year, and I just thought I, they needed somebody new, you know. And the Legion is veterans from all, all branches. All branches, yeah. yeah. doesn't matter. It's the oldest uh, veterans organization in the United States. And it's a really a wonderful, wonderful group. We do a lot for the community. We do a lot for the veterans, you know, and all that. Are there any other nurses? Uh, I, isn't it strange? Because um, in our post, I was the first woman for a long time, you know, in the post. Because my brother was an American Legion man. And some of the teachers from Foster High School, especially Werner Newdorf and people like that, were uh, enrolled in the were American veteran, uh, the American Legion, and uh, so they got me to join. So this this year will start in in uh, September. Will start my twenty eighth year of being with them. Boy, so I've been had every post practically <laughs> in the organization. And so and it takes a lot of time too, but it's good. You know, you meet a lot of. We've had such wonderful people. But we're all getting older now, and we're all kind of dying, uh, some of them, you know, quite a few of the fellows. And uh, it's kind of sad in that sense. We need some younger people, but the people that served in uh, Korea and Vietnam are still raising their families, and they're young, you know, and they don't have quite the time to... Uh, uh, spin, you know, taking offices and stuff like that. But anyway, so anyhow, and I visit, I have a little friend out at the, one of the nursing retirement centers in Federal Way. She'll be 105 in September. She'll be 105. And uh, and I go down to Farrington Court here on Tuesdays and, and we uh, meet with some of the ladies down there and say the rosary and Oh, I don't know. I just 
find like there's lots of things church there's always something to do for church see i think that that's a a, a, a reflection of your generation i was thinking of that yesterday i was at a, a, a small church in olympia a, a mission st christopher's which is just a little teeny about a hundred people but i was uh, and i grew up in a big episcopal church and I was thinking of, of the people that over the years that have kept these running uh -huh. because there's the guilds that do the flowers and do the dress and change from Lent, you know, and it, it, everything yeah. like that. And I think that that, I think it's coming back, but the generation that you grew up with, I mean, you talk about how close your family was. Uh -huh. you, you took care of your mom and your mom took care of you and your brothers and where the world's changed some since uh -huh. then. Yeah, you know. Well, it's like Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, you know. I don't think we'll ever see it that way again, you know, that people are so giving uh, of themselves because it seems like nowadays uh, people have to work so hard to make money. They want money and things and all that, you know, that's important. And it is important, too, but to, um, you know, would we be ready if we had another thing like World War II? You know, would people be willing to put their lives on the line and just pick up and go, you know, from out of high school? I don't know. It seemed to me the last few years our country has gone down so far as far as patriotism is concerned, you know. It's finally, there is this... But we're coming up. Groundswell that, that's in there. But you, you asked interesting questions because, again, it was an, a very interesting time that World War II happened. Here we came out of the Depression, and for a lot of people, that there became the patriotism, but there also was, uh, because there weren't jobs, uh -huh. it, it, it brought everybody back together again. But you did have to give up a lot to go do what you were doing. Well, I think so. But then another great thing that happened to us, when we came back from service, we had the GI Bill. And, you know, I think that's the way most of us went on to college in our profession was to use the GI Bill. You know, we got such good benefits from that, which was wonderful, you know, for us. We took advantage of that, and I wouldn't doubt but what three-fourths of the people that came back from World War II, uh, you know, uh, took advantage of the GI Bill and got out and made something of themselves. And, that's where you look at how much yeah. World War II, you know, in a whole variety of ways, changed our society. Uh -huh. Because you had these young kids that went over and fought, so that changed their view of life. That's right. That's you, right. you came out of the Depression, you had the ones that came back and got the GI Bills. Had World War II not have happened... They wouldn't have had all that. We wouldn't have had all that. No. But because it even the, even the uh, the attitude changed even at Vietnam when of course that was a very bad war because we weren't there to win you know but I know that some of the young teachers men at our school and so forth they if they had been drafted they would have run to Canada instead of serving even though other people were putting their lives of, on the line to save. You to fight for our country. It's interesting. In, in World War II, there were people that ran to Canada, but they were running to Canada so they could get into the service. Yeah. Because they could get in younger up there. They could sneak yeah. into the, you know, the oh, 15, 16-year-old right. kids. Yeah, wanted, that's where the action was. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you en <coughs> did you enjoy your time in the service? I loved it. I just, I can never be thankful enough that, that I served my country, that I went. I can never be thankful enough for all the people I met, for all the friends I had, uh, for the attitude it gave me, you know, toward life. Um, respect for other people. I would do it again in a minute. I would. I oh. thought that was the best thing I did in my life. How much do you think it changed your life? That's a hard one to... Yeah, it is. I always had, uh, well, growing up in a small town in South Dakota, we went to Catholic school. You know, we had pretty good values. And uh, uh, I think 
I don't know, I would have gone on to nursing like I did and graduated and so forth, but I would have had a job, I suppose, and just stayed in nursing for a long time, you know. This kind of opened up my world to me, going, you know, because I, once you get a taste of New York City and places like that, you know, you think, well, there is something out there. Um, so I, I think that as far as who I am and what I believe and how I feel and so forth, I think we always had that, but I think it made it a little stronger by going and appreciative, I think, to appreciate the things that our country gives us. There's no country like America, no country in the world like America, where people can work together so well and become so united. And in time of crisis, you know, that's when it shows, you know. But I, th I don't, I've been to just about every country in Europe and all around, and there's just no country like that. Everybody wants to come to America. They do. We have so much. And I think the one problem with the young people today is that they have so much. Even the little kids, you know, all the computers and everything. Um, everybody tells me I should get one. I don't have one yet. <laughs> and I should, I guess, to be with it. I might now after all this. But um, I don't know what they'd do if they had to go without the things, the necessities of life as we did when we were growing up. They couldn't do it. And of course it would never happen again like that. There will never be another depression like that, I don't think. That's like the big that thing. As I don't think. You don't know. You don't know. It, it, it could happen, but it would be different. It would be different. Yeah. They'd still have all these things, you know, in quotes, things. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, was the, what was the best part of being in the service for you? The best part? I think that's a question, yeah. I think the best part was... Uh, the sense of pride in serving my country. I think that was how it, I could express it. I was so proud to be an Army nurse. I was. I should have stayed in, but I came home, and, you know, after three or so years in the service, you kind of thought, well, I can find something new to do. But uh, I should have stayed in. But I think that was the main thing. Just pride in being an army nurse and serving your country. It would be terrible for me now, for me, to think if after I'm this old, uh, you know, I'll be 81 in May, um, to think that I never had that experience. You know, if I hadn't had that experience, I probably would be as as uh, dim-witted about World War II as other people are today, you know, really, <laughs> because it's such an integral part of me. Your, uh, your mom must have been proud. Mother was always, yeah, she was, she had a struggle. You don't know how she struggled to raise us. She used to work sometimes. I can remember when I was, I was only nine when my father died. My, Youngest brother was three, Gordon was six, I was nine, my other brother was 12, my sister was 14, 15. But uh, she worked for 50 cents a day in a restaurant, you know. Apparently, do you, is this interesting to you? Yeah, oh yes. Her parents came to South Dakota in 1910, and they settled in this little town called Isabel, South Dakota, in the, out on the prairie. And uh, that was the end of the railroad line then. The railroad was coming in, and that was the end of the line. So they came out, and they built a hotel right across the street from the railroad line. So, you know, people would come out homesteading and everything at that time. And that's where, well, Mother grew up in South, they were from Wisconsin, but Mother grew up in South Dakota. They were at other places beside Isabel, but they finally settled in Isabel. And um, uh, 
it was so convenient for people who got off the train and wanted to stay overnight to come over to the West Hotel, like all of us, you know. <laughs> and mother had uh, three brothers, and she was the only girl. And my grandparents sent her to Sioux City, Iowa on that train she, for her music and voice lessons, you know. And so that was really great. And uh, then uh, she had a brother. Uh, we called him Uncle Will. His name was William, Uncle Will. He was a salesman of first class. And he used to take mother with him when he was selling things when she was a teenager in high, you know. So on one of her trips, when they got down to Watertown, South Dakota, apparently she met my father. And he was from a Parker, clan that lived near Watertown and his parents had this well I think it was one of the most beautiful homes in that part of the country there and um, his father was very proud he was English very proud his mother was Irish and she was as gentle as a lamb you know but um, uh, he had three sons who had big farms all around him, you know. My father was one of them. But, and of course, mother met him, and I guess the way she tells it, they only saw each other four times before they decided to get married. So they had this big wedding in Isabel, January 31st, 1913. And here she was, this beautiful musician. She'd never been on a farm in her life. And he took her down there, and she was on this farm, and, you know, that was really hard for her. So, anyhow, when my father died, she was left, you know, with the, with the farm. And so wow. we tried to continue farming, but eventually we ended up out at Isabel with her parents. And from Isabel, she worked every day, like I say, for about 50 cents a day. But then uh, she got this job with the government, WPA, you know, in, in Timberlake. And then from that, she, um, she became postmistress in the little town. And uh, she, she beat several men for the exam. She outdid <laughs> them. She got that job, so that was pretty good. When she was... Uh, when I was a junior in high school, mother got really sick. She had a very bad ulcer, and she was off work for about two months. So I quit high school as a junior and worked in the post office, took over the post office for her with her helper, you know. But anyhow, we survived that. And then she, um, so when she had the post office then, um, there was another family in town, Sherber's, Sherbers, the German too, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so uh, Martin, that was the father. He had three or four kids that were going. We were going all going to school together. It's funny in that little town we had a Catholic school, you know, and uh, the nuns, the presentation nuns. So uh, mother and Martin kind of hooked up, you know. So they got married just just shortly after Betty's. Uh, Lowell went went into service. So mother and he were married for about seven years, and then he died to cancer. So mother was left again, and uh, she stayed there in Timberlake for a while, and, and eventually she sold out. She came out here, and she was a house mother at Seattle U for about 10 years. Huh. We had some good uh, Jesuit friends. You know, they're so wonderful, the Jesuits. And uh, they were so good to us. So uh, she was a house mother there. And then she eventually came out and we lived together. And that was really good. A little difficult at first. <laughs> <laughs> I must, you know, facing reality. But was, I was gone a lot. Was she, uh, where was she when you went into the Army? She was she at Seattle, you being a house mother? Oh, or? no, no, no. She was at Timberlake. She oh, was oh, in, oh. in the post office. Huh. At Timberlake. So do you remember telling her you were going in the Army? Well, see, I was in Seattle. Gordon and I came to Seattle then. <coughs> um, yeah, I came out to Seattle in, uh, 
Well, that was early. Um, it, my brother Gordon, that's where he joined the Marines, was from Seattle. He wrote home and told Mother he was going to the Marines. Well, she, she knew that this would happen. And then after he left and I was in Seattle a while, then I decided to join the Nurse Corps. So I wrote and told her I was doing. But it was kind of fun because I went to Pocatello, Idaho, you know, air base, and uh, mother would come out. She came out a couple times, I think, to the air base. And of course, she could play the piano like nobody's business, you know. And in the officer's club, we'd all get together and she'd play the piano and we'd all sing and everything, you know. So it was really good. So she didn't think it would be too bad, you know, being in service. She hated to see us go overseas, and she hated it when Gordon was in the Pacific, especially because that he went through everyone, Tarawa, Saipan, Iwo Jima, all those terrible, terrible places. Yeah, so he did his service, and he just died two years ago in March. He, uh, he, he was so proud to be a Marine. He would not put a flag on his grave until Bill Clinton was no longer president. <laughs> That's right. I he liked your brother. <laughs> yeah, right. He was a. He could not bear that. He would not let us. He said, "Don't put a flag on my grave until Bill Clinton is gone." So when well, we all felt that way about him, but um, he had fifteen children. He fathered fifteen. Can you imagine that? Those two <laughs> brothers of mine kept mother and I busy. You wonder what I did with my spare time. <laughs> but, you know, every one of those kids have in, been instilled so much with his philosophy and his way of thinking in life that they all feel the same way. Gordon's, my brother's kids, all. He had 11 boys and four girls. Wow. One little boy died when he was about nine months old, but other than that, there were 14 living children. And they just worship his, their father. And he's got on his uh, tombstone, he's got Semper Fi, you know, with the Marine symbol. <laughs> so the service, it sounds like, was very good for your brother. Oh, well, he was so proud, too, to have served. Well, at that time, yes, it was very good. Uh, we had no idea what it was going to be like at that time, you know, in 43. Uh, it was just getting really good and hot over there in the Pacific. So when he went, it was really, uh, really something. What was the worst part of being in the Army? The worst part? I think it was missing home. You know, you, you can't help but miss your home, and miss, uh, miss being with your well, my mother, you know, I always felt that it was my responsibility to take care of my mother anyway, because I was a middle child, you know, and I always took care of the boys and everything when we were growing up. If mother worked, I was the one that did the housework and washing and all that stuff. And so I always felt like there was going to be a time when I would, mother would be with me. And I can remember the night before my father died, uh, I was so young then. I was staying with one of my uncles whose house was about maybe two miles from his parents' house. And uh, my father um, had cancer of the pancreas, and he was in such pain all the time. But the night before he died, they uh, took me up to see him because he, when he came, he, he was at a political convention in November in Pierce, South Dakota. He was a Democrat then. We were all Democrats then. <laughs> and um, and he got sick while he was there, and he came home. And in January, February, he went to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and they diagnosed him with uh, cancer of the pancreas, and they couldn't do anything for it. They sent him home, but he couldn't come to our house because we all had whooping cough. So he had to go to his mother's house, you know, so he was with his mother all the time until um, he died. But they sent me, the night before he died, they sent me up to see him, and, and he talked to me, you know, like a father would to a child, I suppose, you know, be a good girl and all that, you know. But I can remember he said one thing that always stuck with me. 
I shouldn't say that. He said, take care of Mama. You know? So, I don't think that that was a hard and fast rule I had to follow. I mean, I don't think he meant it that way that I should, but he meant just be good to her. And, that, and you took that and on I as did. your, your, you took yeah. care of your mom for your dad. Yeah. No, I know how that is. I, I have this, the same, my mom passed away two years ago and I oh. have the same Thanks. deal with my mom that take care of dad. Yeah. You know. See. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, well, it just worked out fine for us. After we got adjusted to each other, <laughs> well, you, you know, she was independent. She was a great visitor. She loved. She went, I took her everywhere with me. She loved to go to the Legion meetings and she'd talk to all the guys and everything. You know, <laughs> she was. She was just a good. Well, I, I and, see where you get it now. And wherever she went, you know, she was at the piano if there was one. You know, so anyhow, that's that's. That was that little story. I can just the the the, the picture you described in Pocatello. I can picture you and your mom and these soldiers that just there was a piece of home and this lady filling their life with yeah oh and they were all in uniform you know and they looked they always looked so nice you know those bars on their shoulders well of course the nurses were in uniform too then you know but it was always so wonderful you know we were all so. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was fun. It was nice. It's always nice to have a song fest wherever you go, you know, just to really sing out. We used to do that a lot in India at the club, you know, we'd sing. Band. Did, did they have, at the club, was there somebody in India that played the piano that you all gathered around? Or? Uh, with uh, Well, not uh, unless we were at the, I don't know if we had a piano at that uh, club. I don't know. But the, the GI band was there. The GI band, you know, was there all the time, and uh, uh, all the instruments and everything. But I can't remember that there was a piano there. I but don't lots think of, so. Lots of singing, though. Lots of singing, though. Lots now, was that singing. after the that you shared that uh, uh, bottle of whiskey you talked about? Well, <laughs> during, I suppose. <laughs> during that's, the whole time. That's I talked to a gentleman that was in the. England and he was telling about scrounging so he had to do some scrounging for the boys to, uh -huh. yeah. to get them to some get good it. Irish whiskey to <laughs> cigarettes were a good trading uh, device you um, what now it's interesting because you uh, now are a part of the American Legion and 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 you have a life experience that, that, that I'll never have mm -hmm. which was being a part of World War II, mm -hmm. serving your country. And, and, I, and I view myself as being patriotic. But when you see the American flag in a parade or wherever, what does that mean to you? It's, it's a symbol of, of hope. It's a symbol of patriotism. It stirs your heart. You're so proud proud, proud to be an American. That's why I can't understand when people like Patty Murray will not vote for the flag amendment. You know, she thinks that's uh, decrying free speech. But to that flag, look what the... I should give you a copy of this little thing I have about Mike's flag. What some of these boys that were in Vietnam in prison what the flag meant to them. That meant America. That meant our country. That's the symbol of our country. And they don't realize that, you know. I remember we used to have parades at home and everything, you know, on the 4th of July and all. Hats off along the street there comes a blur, bugles a ruffle of drums, you know that poem. The flag is passing by. And everybody used to almost stand there and put their hand over their heart and hearts and and uh, just you know you were just so proud to think that we were Americans that's what I think it stands for America land of the free and home of the brave we talked to uh, uh, 
a gentleman that was a, a German POW, and in the camp they had taken scraps of material and they had sewn this flag. And he said, because I asked him what was the what was the, the best moment in that when you were in that camp. And he said that they got up one morning and the, and the German guards were gone from the towers. And he says he can remember them climbing up in the tower and raising this flag that they'd sewed together from all that and seeing the um, seeing the German flag taken down and that American flag. Uh -huh. you know, That's yeah. like this little poem I have in there, Mike's flag. How he worked and worked in the Vietnam prison, you know, the Hanoi Hilton, Jane Fonda's famous place. <laughs> yeah. You know what I think of some of these I people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how he, he worked so to make a flag out of practically nothing, you know, and how much it meant to him, you know. And I think once they got him, found him doing that, and of course they tortured him and everything, but he came back and started right over again. But the flag stands for America. There's no country in the world like America. I don't think. And you've been around yeah. to see it. I mean, yeah. you've been other. Did, now, did, did uh, um, you didn't you didn't bring a special soldier home with you? There was uh, no Mr. Parker. No deep romance. <laughs> no deep romance. <laughs> oh, I met so many nice fellows. They were all so nice. Yeah, there were a few that I think. Uh, uh, after the after I got home, I went back to New York City because one was from New York, the one that was in that picture. Oh yeah. With me, I went back there, and uh, and I saw him, and it was nice. It was nice seeing him again. But he was wounded, you know, in a combat flying. He was a you know, navigator in a B twenty four bomber, and uh, and uh, so. But we got to see each other, and I don't know, we just sort of, I don't know what, at that time I was still kind of restless having come home from India and everything, you know. So nothing materialized there. But I've, I've met a lot of really wonderful fellows. So I, I, you know, I usually had someone around. <laughs> did, did, did you lose any friends in the war? Did I? Well, except for those nurse friends, and who else? I can't remember that anyone that I really knew directly that I was very fond of that that died during the war. Oh, I I do, because when when I joined the the service, um, everybody in our high school wanted to go to war. You know, it was a little high school. And in my class, uh, there was this boy, Claudius Kraft, and then there was a fellow ahead of us. Um, uh, he was uh, an Indian boy. But anyway, uh, Claudius um, was one of 17 children at that time. He was the nicest young man, and he enjoyed, he joined the army and everything, and he was killed shortly after, over on, in Europe somewhere, shortly after uh, the war had started. So that was really kind of a tragedy for us. And um, and uh, and the other boy, oh, I know his name like I know my own, he was killed over Sardinia, the island of Sardinia. When they're, they're boys, you know, from home that get killed, you know, for going. Um, that's kind of too bad, you know, you feel that pretty much, you know, from home. So those two boys died right off the bat. For, I know my uh, mom talked about um, when they had her 49th class reunion or 50th, I forget which it was, but it was interesting because there were all these young men at the reunion, but she doesn't remember them because they really didn't graduate with them. Uh, I mean, they got their diploma, but they were over overseas. fighting. Yeah. yeah. So it was, you know, she looked around, uh, who are these guys? Yeah. So, huh. But it's funny how quite a few of my classmates, that were 35 in my class when I graduated in 1938, but quite a few of those boys are dead now, and 
quite a few of them went to service, you know, but they didn't die in service, but they've died since. But it just uh, makes me feel that every day is precious on earth. Be oh. more precious up there, I guess. But uh, <laughs> You're going to enjoy where <laughs> you're at. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, we have to make the most of where we are. But it's kind of sad when you look at the picture. In 1985, we had an all-class reunion in Timberlake, South Dakota. And there were about 5,000 people came home to that little town of 600 people. It was really fabulous. And we had the class, classes had reunions, you know. But when I look at that picture and I look and see how many of those boys are dead now already, and they're just my age. Because I don't think I'm very old. You know, there are lots of people a lot older than I am that are still very, very, very active. And I'm going to be too. Well, I was going to say, I, yeah, think. I, I think you're going to get that letter from the president <laughs> for the for the hundred <laughs> years. <laughs> well, thank know. you very much. It was a well, pleasure. It was so nice of you to come and spend all this time. But like I say, I'm not. I kind of jump from one thing to another. We but, all do. That's the but, way we think. That's the way we... <laughs> Some things come to mind and you think it might be of interest to someone else or anything like that, you know. See, it's interesting because, you know, history made, and, and Andy Rooney dispelled a lot of this, but history made World War II this, this thing of heroes and heroism. And, and yes, there were, but there were a lot of average, everyday people. That right. just went and did whatever they had to do. That's right. They weren't all on the front lines. No, I know, and and that's in our little book, Missing Pieces. There's about sixty some people that have written little articles about an experience or something when they were in World War Two, and it isn't just all the people that went to war that helped with the with the war effort. It was people that stayed home and went without gasoline or sugar and worked on the railroad and stuff like that and kept kept it going. And that's when they started, uh, you know, women's, women's lib, really. <laughs> when the women started to work in the factories and stuff, you know, because uh, the uh, uh, boys were gone and they had to keep them going and so the women <laughs> took it over. <laughs> but that was good, too. You know, in the sense that it just kind of changed after World War Two, things began to change. You know, that was it. A lot of the women. See, my mom was a card-carrying welder, and she made uh, pineapple grenades. Was uh, oh. part of what she. But her dad had a foundry, and yeah. And, uh, but see, if we didn't have them doing that and working on building airplanes and stuff like that, we wouldn't have got to first base. See, know? and that's where the. The sad part was is that the war was over, and for a lot of women, they said, well, thank you very much. Now go back to Being raising children. Life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we talked to women pilots that, you know, they flew the planes that Boeing made and flew them over and tested them and did whatever. And then when the war was over, it was there were men coming back that had been over there fighting. And, and the women we talked to didn't begrudge that. They said, you know, they were over and saw serious action, and uh -huh. so... Well, look what they did in Desert Storm. I think women were really quite active over there in those airplanes and everything. I think that's, I think that's a marvelous thing if they have the ability to do that. You know, really. And that's where the world's progressed in that's a lot of right. ways. That's it's right. It's interesting because World War II changed not only women, but it did a lot for racism because uh, a, a lot of African Americans had didn't live out in this area, but with the service, they got spread all over the country, given different opportunities, and the world changed again, so. Huh. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, surely.